All right, now what happens to the pyruvic acid? Um, in aerobic respiration, and we'll talk about what happens in anaerobic respiration later, but for now we'll stick with what happens when there is oxygen present and the cell can use the oxygen, is that the pyruvic acid is going to be sent to um, another reaction that sometimes is called the bridge reaction. Some people call it the bridge reaction. Some people think of it as the last step of glycolysis. Some people think of it as the first step of the Krebs cycle, which is coming next. I'm just going to call it the bridge reaction. And in the bridge reaction, we take this three carbon pyruvic acid. And what's going to come out of the uh, bridge reaction is something called acetyl or acetyl CoA. Um, essentially, uh, this thing is going to, oh, sorry. Acetyl-CoA has two carbons, um, not counting the CoA part, but the, the acetate part has two carbons. So something with three carbons comes in and something with two carbons comes out. I, I say we don't have to worry about the CoA because it's going to just come off again at the next step anyway. Three carbons go in, two carbons come out. That means that a carbon dioxide is released. And it also means that we broke a carbon-carbon bond and come out. That means that a carbon dioxide is released. And it also means that we broke a carbon-carbon bond. And the theme of metabolism is that when we break a carbon-carbon bond, um, energy is released and we get to make a high-energy molecule. And in this case, the high-energy molecule that we get to make is we get to turn an NAD into an NADH. So if you're keeping track, so far we have an NADH from this bridge reaction, but this pyruvic acid is also going to go into its own bridge reaction, and it's going to produce you know, acetyl-CoA, um, carbon dioxide, and it's going to convert an NAD into an NADH. These acetyl-CoAs, their next step is uh, what sometimes people call and you're going to hear me call it this, people call it the Krebs cycle. Some people call it the citric acid cycle. And some people call it the tricarboxylic tri acid cycle, or TCA cycle. They all refer to the same thing. So what's going to happen in the Krebs cycle is that we start with this acetyl-CoA, which has two carbons. And there's going to be an enzyme that grabs that acetyl-CoA and also grabs a four-carbon compound called oxalo. So what's going to happen in the Krebs cycle is that we start with this acetyl-CoA, which has two carbons. And there's going to be an enzyme that grabs that acetyl-CoA and also grabs a four-carbon compound called oxaloacetic acid and joins them together to form a six-carbon compound called citric acid. And, you know, that's why the Krebs cycle is also called the citric acid cycle. Um, now, in an introductory biology class, you're almost never required to remember the names or the structures of all the intermediate compounds in these biochemical pathways. So I'm not actually going to go beyond this. I'm not actually going to write the names of the intermediates. Um, uh, but what is important is that you keep track of how many carbons are involved in the different molecules and what are the things that come in and come out. So we'll go over that. Uh, an enzyme is going to grab this citric acid, sorry, this six carbon compound and turn it and rearrange it a little bit into a different six carbon compound. And something else will take that and, re and, and turn it into a five carbon compound. Something takes that five carbon compound and turns it into a four carbon compound. And something will take that four carbon compound and turn it into a different four carbon compound. Then we get a different four carbon compound. And we get yet another four carbon compound. And finally, we're going to have an enzyme that takes this four carbon compound called malic acid and convert it into 
oxaloacetic acid, which then is available to be joined to yet another acetyl-CoA for another round of the cycle. So that's what makes the Krebs cycle a cycle. It sort of regenerates itself. And if you're doing the carbon accounting the way you should be, um, you should notice that when we move from six carbons to five carbons, this step here, we're losing a carbon. And the carbon is going to come off as a carbon dioxide. Similarly here, when we move from a five carbon compound to a four carbon compound, we're going to lose a carbon. So if you look at the cycle as a whole, two carbons go in, two carbons come out. So again, we're not creating or destroying any carbons here. And the other thing to keep in mind is that, uh, like I said before, the theme of respiration is that when we break carbon carbon sorry when we break carbon carbon bonds, energy is released, and that energy is used to make some high energy high energy molecules. So indeed, in this case, when we break off this carbon dioxide, um, a carbon carbon bond has been broken, and this step also lets us take an NAD and convert it into an NADH. This step here, we're also going to take an NAD and convert it into an NADH. Now the other thing that I said earlier was that uh, this relationship between making high energy molecules and losing carbons or breaking carbon-carbon bonds isn't particularly tidy. Well, that's sort of reflected in the fact that in these steps we're also going to make some high energy molecules even though we're not decarboxylating any molecules. So this step here from a four carbon to another four carbon, this molecule has enough energy in it from the previous reactions that we're going to convert an ADP into an ATP. It's actually a little complicated. There's a GDP and GTP intermediate, but it's not really important. So I'm just going to simplify it by saying that we get to turn an ADP into an ATP. Here, we're going to turn an FAD into another energy carrier called FADH2, that's a high energy molecule, and um, here we're going to uh, convert another NAD into an NADH. So one cycle of the Krebs cycle gets us uh, one ATP, uh, one FADH2, and three NADHs. But, you know, you'll remember that that's one NADH, I'm sorry, one ATP, one FADH2, and one FADH2 per acetyl-CoA. But you'll remember that we got two acetyl-CoAs um, out of two runnings of the bridge reaction because we got two pyruvic acids out of glycolysis. So, so if I'm going to redraw this entire um, uh, set of reactions, you know, I'd, I'd sort of start with you know glycolysis and glycolysis. If we start with one glucose from glycolysis, we're going to get two pyruvic acids. The two pyruvic acids are going to go into the bridge reactions, and the bridge reactions are going to get us um, acetyl-CoA's. The acetyl-CoA's end up going into their Krebs cycles. So, if glycolysis gets us here, if glycolysis gets us uh, two ATPs and two NADHs, and each running of the bridge reaction gets us one NADH. But since there are two bridge reactions, we're going to have two NADHs, and each running of the Krebs cycle gets us one ATP, one FADH2, and three NADHs. So two runnings of the Krebs cycle are going to get us two ATPs, two FADH2s, and six NADHs. So this, in total, 
means we have four ATPs, two FADH2s, and 10 NADHs. All right, so what about those FADH2s and NADH uh, molecules? Because, uh, you know, like I said, cellular processes are great at using ATP, but they can't really use NADH or FADH2 directly, even though they have a lot of energy in them. So imagine that somebody's invited you to go to a casino for the very first time, and you go, and you do really well. You, you win a lot of hands of, um, I don't know, blackjack. And you're really excited because you figure somebody's about to hand you a whole bunch of $100 bills. But instead, they just give you these little colored plastic discs. And you say, what are these? I thought I was winning money. I can't buy anything with these colored plastic discs. And the dealer says, oh, no, don't worry. They're chips. Uh, you take the chips to that booth over there, and somebody will take the chips from you and give you money. Each chip is going to be worth a particular amount of money. Well. You can think of NADH and FADH2 as being something like um, metabolism chips. Uh, the NADH has enough energy stored in it that it'll be worth, um, after the next process in the electron transport chain, it'll be worth something like three ATPs. And every FADH2 is going to end up being worth two ATPs. In the next video, where we talk about uh, uh, oxidative phosphorylation and the electron transport chain, um, you'll see how it works, um, how the energy in the NADH is converted into the energy of uh, an electron, which is converted into the energy of what we call a proton gradient, and that is used to drive the reaction of phosphorylating an ADP into an ATP.